Hari Jai Radha Madhava Punjabi Hari Gopi Jana Balava Girivara Dhari Gopi Jana Balava Girivara Dhari Shishodha Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Shishodha Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Panachari Jamuna Tira Panachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Shishodhanandana Braja Jana Ranjana Shishodhanandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Vanachari Jamuna Tira Vanachari Jamuna Tira Vanachari Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Kupi Jana Balaba Giribaradhari Gopi Jana Balaba Girivara Dhari Chishodha Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Chishodha Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Vanachari Jamuna Tira Vanachari Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Sisi Radha Madhava Ki Now you can see Prabhupada better, right? More light? Yes? Too much light over here. So in some places in the world today is uh, Prabhupada's Disappearance Day. We celebrated yesterday. I thought we could speak about the meaning of disappearance, how we deal with the disappearance of the spiritual master. Did the spiritual, does the spiritual master actually disappear? Or does it just seem that way? I think it's important because we will, it, apparently many great devotees have disappeared and will continue to disappear. And if we can discuss how they haven't disappeared or what causes disappearance, it's not a phys, physical disappearance does not cause disappearance. They disappear in other ways, and it's caused by us, not by them. So I want to discuss that. Maum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Shami Tinamana Namaste Sharashati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvi Sesa Sunyavari Pashati Dasatarine Mukam Karuti Vachalam Pangolangai Tegirin Yakrapata Mahambande Siguru Dinatarinam Panchakalpa Turvisha Krapashim Devija Patitanam Pavanavio Vaishnavidya Namami. I was speaking yesterday, uh, the Sunday feast in Alachua, 
giving some examples of, of how Prabhupada always felt his spiritual master to be with him. And that's interesting because Prabhupada writes a viraha ashtakam, uh, eight prayers of separation. Viraha means separation. Ashta means eight. Ashtakam, um, it's like a stanzas, eight stanzas of separation. So Prabhupada's saying, I was always feel, feeling my spiritual master, and then he's writing eight stanzas of separation. Isn't that interesting? So it requires some analysis of how is it that he's uh, always feeling the presence. He said that he was always in his heart, he was always with him. At the same time, he's feeling separation. If you read the prayer, you will find that Prabhupada is describing the consequences in Gaudiya Mat of, uh, that happened after the departure of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. And that's what he's lamenting about, the effects of the loss of the spiritual master, because he felt the separation within the organization, that the instruction was absent. So he never felt Bhakti Siddhanta's absence, but he felt the absence of his instructions within the organization. Isn't that interesting? I think it's very important to recognize. If Prabhupada's instructions are valued and followed, not minimized, interpreted, buried, forgotten, compromised, rationalized, then Prabhupada remains present, even though physically he's not present. And even if he's physically present, if his instructions are compromised, forgotten, rationalized, minimized, etc., then he's not present. Because Srila Prabhupada's presence is not physical, it's transcendental. And his presence really is his instruction, because, I mean, what would you rather have? Prabhupada who couldn't speak, you know, physically, or Prabhupada's instruction? Yeah, we would take his instructions, wouldn't we? So if you take a Prabhupada without the instruction, do you have Prabhupada? Well, there's a picture, there's a movie, even Prabhupada personally. But without his instruction, what do you have? You don't, you know, Prabhupada said, I live in my books. I will never die. He was asked, what will happen after you die? I will never die. I will always live in my books. So if Prabhupada is alive in his books, it means I live through my instructions. That's how I stay alive. Specifically, those who follow those instructions, they, they, then Prabhupada becomes alive in their life. So in a sense, disappearance day is a misnomer because it's only a physical disappearance. And, and Prabhupada used to say, well, that's not that important. The vapu or the body is not important. The vani or the instruction is what's important. And Prabhupada said, after all, the body's not going to be here that much longer, but the instructions will remain. So what happens when the instructions remain? The institution remains intact. It remains loyal to the disciplic succession. And it's through that loyalty that it has its power. And it's through that loyalty that it becomes successful. And just like you and I, we're all trying to share Krishna consciousness, we're sharing it as we've gotten it from Srila Prabhupada. If we share it as we've gotten it, it remains powerful. Even we may not be powerful, but the instruction is powerful. So, you know, you may not be powerful, but if you have an atom bomb and you can hit the button, you're pretty powerful, aren't you? So the instructions are something like that. They're the atom bomb against Maya. So, the disappearance of the spiritual master can only be a disappearance of instruction, not a disappearance of physical, because Prabhupada always said the physical is not that important. Of course, for us as disciples, it was important, uh, definitely inspirational, uh, definitely changed our hearts in so many ways. There's no question. But Prabhupada means in the long run that the physical presence is, is not the real presence. It's not what's going to keep somebody going forever. You know, that, that those three memories of the time I was with Prabhupada, they, they in a sense keep us going, but it's only because we have the instructions really that we can keep going. Those are, those are, you could say, that's an impetus to read the instruction or to follow the instruction. But 
instructions have to be there. So well, let's let's take an example of Rupa Goswami. We are called Rupa Anugas. Anuga means to follow. So there's a prana mantra to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. Rupa Anuga Virudapa Siddhanta Dvanta Harine. So he said that uh, this prana mantra Srila Bhakti Siddhanta says that he never deviated from the Siddhanta, the conclusions of Rupa Goswami. So Rupa Anuga means that our disciplic succession coming down from Brahma to Madhva through Lord Chaitanya, it follows, it follows a path and that path goes through Rupa Goswami. So Rupa Goswami is like a foundational acharya for Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Not, um, not the head, Brahma is the head, but the teachings that Mahaprabhu brought, they are primarily, and also Sanatana and the other Goswamis, Jiva Goswami, but Rupa Goswami takes a special place that whatever we understand should be the Siddhanta given by Rupa Goswami. So we are reading Nectar of Instruction, we're reading Nectar of Devotion. Rupa Goswami lived over 500 years ago. It's still alive and well in the Hare Krishna movement and in Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Uh, in all bona fide forms of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, it's alive and well, 500 years ago. And Prabhupada took Rupa Goswami's instructions and then he clarified them because that's what the Sipak succession does. It takes the instructions of previous acharyas and then it clarifies them so that the modern audience can understand it. So we are a movement of preservation. Disciplic succession is, is all about preservation of instruction. And when you don't preserve, then you lose the presence of those acharyas because they're present in their instruction. So when Prabhupada gave us nectar of devotion, it was in 1970. So when I joined, it had not yet been printed. So it's kind of a momentous occasion when a new book is printed. Now it's just usually a reprint of an existing book or it's a printing of some lectures that are already on the database you could read. And there's of course nothing new that Prabhupada is writing because that's not possible, although others may write new books. But in terms of Prabhupada's books, when Prabhupada came up with a new book, it was a big deal. So when Prabhupada came out with a book, he told us that if you read Nectar Devotion, you are personally associating with Rupa Goswami. Well, that's interesting, right? Rupa Goswami was present 500 years ago, and now we're personally associating with him through his instruction. So really, the, du the duty of the spiritual master is to preserve the teachings of the former acharyas and present those teachings, teachings so a modern audience can understand them, clarify them. Because as Kali Yuga progresses, as culture changes, things have to be explained in a way that people can better understand them. You, if you read uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, you may not understand what he's saying, although he's saying what you already know, <clears throat> more or less, but the language is very intellectual. And the words being used maybe are not common words that we use today. The concepts may maybe are not commonly understood. So the acharyas come and they clarify. And early in the movement, Prabhupada said, don't read the books of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, you won't understand, you'll understand them through me. And he was, because oftentimes they're speaking to a different audience. And so if you're not part of that audience, then it's not clear. So <clears throat> what we are going to be doing in the Hare Krishna movement in ISKCON, we are continually going to be explaining Prabhupada's instructions as we do every class as an explanation, right? We read from his books. We're so we're going to be continually explaining his instructions for the next 10,000 years. That's, that's what we do. And by doing that, we're keeping people close to Prabhupada for the next 10,000 years. You know, someone may say, you know, why are you writing a book? We have Prabhupada's books. Well, we write books to clarify what Prabhupada's saying, because maybe you don't understand it, or you can understand it better. Or maybe I've had 50 years to understand it, you're just joining, so I will help you. I'll, I'll bring you up to speed uh, very quickly. So that's good, but what am I doing? I'm just trying to clarify 
what Prabhupada taught. So, so that way, uh, I don't get in the way, but I make Prabhupada's presence felt by you. Uh, uh, some people might say, well, if you have an intermediary, somebody's getting in the way between you and Prabhupada. Well, your glasses are an intermediary, so take them off. Don't wear them. Second, you know, how do you see? Everything is fuzzy without my glasses. Yeah, but you want you want direct, you want to see it directly, take them off. Why are you using them? It's a crutch. So subsequent spiritual masters are like glasses to, to clarify. Uh, what, what did Prabhupada mean when he said this? What was the context in which he said it? What else did he say about this? You know, someone who's read this all can, is in better position to explain it. And some of us were even there when it was explained. Like we, we know exactly. So we're in a good position that maybe others uh, wouldn't be to understand it if they didn't know the context. So that's the Hare Krishna movement. It's, it's perpetually going to keep people connected to Srila Prabhupada and Srila Rupa Goswami. That's what we do, right? So therefore, Prabhupada never disappears. There's no such thing as Prabhupada's disappearance. He can't disappear. As long as the books stay in print, as long as we're teaching them, as long as we're explaining them, as long as we're following them, he can't disappear. How can Prabhupada, what is the real disappearance, Dave? When we minimize Prabhupada, that's his disappearance. Dave. When you all stop reading Prabhupada's books, when you all stop following his instructions, that's the disappearance day of Srila Prabhupada for you. When you stop chanting your rounds, you stop reading his books, you stop your sadhana. That's Prabhupada's disappearance day in your life. That's the only way he can disappear. Otherwise, he's here. Now, um, of course, those of you who didn't see Prabhupada in this life, maybe you saw him in the last life. We don't know. But those of you who didn't see Prabhupada in this life, um, probably wish that you could see him. But the reality is that you are doing better than many, many, many of Prabhupada's direct disciples who are not, who have uh, left Krishna consciousness or deviated in some way, slackened their sadhana. If you're, if you're following devotional practices regularly, chanting your rounds, following principles, and, and then you're doing actually a lot better than a lot of Prabhupada's disciples. So, that personal association, as I said, is a great impetus and a great blessing. There's no question. And necessary to keep us going. But only, be, only because we couldn't fully appreciate Prabhupada's presence in his instruction. Now, if we look at Prabhupada's example. He, didn't, he said he met Srila Bhakti Siddhanta six times. And and part of meeting him just meant being in a lecture, not actually personally meeting him. So he didn't have a lot of personal association and he came out the most successful. And if you will, if you wanted to do an analysis of who is the, who are the most successful devotees in ISKCON, it's you're not, the graphs are not gonna be going towards those who had more association with Prabhupada. There's, that's no indication at all. It doesn't go that way. Many, many, who were leaders in ISKCON who had much, a lot of Prabhupada's association are no longer um, in the forefront of the movement or not even part of it. So, and you have devotees who had little or no association with Prabhupada, but who took his mission seriously, took his instruction seriously. And now they're leaders, many of our leaders, I mean, you, you wouldn't know, but Many, many of our leaders, many of the GBC have practically, you know, met Prabhupada a few times at most in a class, not even spoken or a letter or anything. But as devotees said, devotees say that, you know, reading Prabhupada's book, sometimes it feels like he's speaking to me directly, like it's a letter. Like oftentimes I feel like every purport, read it like it's a letter to you. You know, it has, if you read it that way, it's got power. And I think, wow, this is Prabhupada's writing to me uh, a letter. Uh, there's a story. Um, one devotee saw Prabhupada translating, and Prabhupada was sitting like something like this, like for the longest time. 
not moving. Um, and later, it was Prabhupada's secretary, he asked him, you know, was something wrong? Did you have a headache or, you know, an anxiety about something? He said, no, I was translating. I had to choose every word. I was trying to choose the right word. So Prabhupada's choosing the right word. <laughs> and so it, res it's, it resonates deep within the heart of the conditioned soul. So we, we, we as Prabhupada disciples, of course, we feel separation, but like Prabhupada, I think most of the separation we feel is, is um, when Prabhupada's instructions aren't being implemented or they're being compromised in some way or forgotten, then, then we feel, that's how we feel separation. Or, why? or when things are not done exactly the way that Prabhupada taught us to do, we feel like, oh, Prabhupada is, he's not here. He's not here in this kirtan. He's not here in this class. He's not here in this festival. We feel that way. Uh, we don't want to be offensive. It's just, well, we know. Well, no, Prabhupada didn't do it that way or said not to do it that way. So um, that's something, you know, gradually you will learn or you will, should want to learn how Prabhupada did everything. And, and so we can represent him. And so in that way, if ISKCON is following Prabhupada, ISKCON is successful, then we can say that Prabhupada's in the center. There, there has always been this move to keep Prabhupada in the center, but it's not that you just put a murti in the temple and then Prabhupada is in the center. That's a mechanistic, ritualistic way. Um, it doesn't mean anybody's going to follow anything. But when you take the instructions to heart, then we are keeping Prabhupada center in our life and we're keeping him uh, in the center of the movement. So I think that's an extremely important point. Uh, I just want to emphasize again, what really really all I really wanted to say is disappearance. The disappearance day of Prabhupada only happens when he disappears, when his instructions disappear, when we are no longer following him. Otherwise, there is no disappearance. And, and vice versa, when you follow his instructions, then you feel his presence. So don't follow, he's not there. Follow, he's there. And you all already know this because you must have this experience. And um, I said yesterday, when you take more responsibility for Prabhupada's movement, when you take responsibility to bring more people to Krishna consciousness, when you distribute Prabhupada's books, when you distribute the Holy Name, you do these things. In any way you can, according to your situation, you feel closer to Prabhupada because this movement is his baby, basically. And when you take care of his baby, he's very happy. And you will feel that. And you will feel it not only in terms of feeling satisfied and happy, but you'll feel it in terms of bliss, transcendental, spiritual inspiration. One time Prabhupada said, my spiritual master, he emphasized book distribution. And he said, I am also emphasizing, I believe Prabhupada said whipping. My spiritual master was whipping, distribute books. I'm whipping you and you will whip others. I don't know if whip was the word, but something like that. I'm pushing, I, he pushed me, I push you, you push others. So that's the parampara, whatever. However, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta pushed Prabhupada, he pushed us to do the same thing, distribute books open temples, create diorama exhibits, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then you will push the people that you teach. Yeah, we have to do this. This is what Prabhupada wants. And then that way, Prabhupada remains strong in our movement. I, I've made some observations um, over the years. And I don't know if you know this history. It's kind of, it's a bit subjective. I think it's objective, 
but subjective in the sense that I don't think people uh, talk about this much. I've never, I haven't heard anyone talk about it, but after Prabhupada left, for about three years, the movement grew bigger and bigger. We were, we were really feeling the burden of responsibility and we wanted to take us gone forward in Prabhupada's absence. That was our, our main focus. We have now inherited everything that Prabhupada created for us and we can't, we can't let it fall. So uh, the mo momentum of the Hare Krishna movement was building up every year and it kept building after Prabhupada left for, I don't know the exact year, I'd say maybe until 1980, 81. Book distribution increased, more devotees were coming, more temples were being opened. That, that um, level of expansion just continued or even continued more so. And then it started going down. There were problems with some of the gurus. And there were also um, questions the devotees had. Is, is, and the questions were, should we continue doing what we've always done? Should we just go out on Harinam? Should we just distribute books? Should we just do the Bhakta programs like we used to do them? And so there was lots of doubts about that. And maybe, maybe we need to do things differently. And so a lot of the, the bread and butter programs started dwindling and new programs were coming up to be say all so-called better alternatives. And the movement started going down, like every year was getting worse. And when it made a turnaround, at least from my perception, although I haven't studied this as if I were writing a PhD or something, but at least from my perception, the turnaround and the, the rejuvenation of our movement was that we went back to doing the things, a lot of the things that we had kind of drifted away from, thinking maybe it's not appropriate anymore, um, like book distribution, we kind of drifted from it. Maybe we should, maybe people don't like the books. Maybe we should do something else or just going out on Harinam. Maybe we look like a bunch of clowns. People don't take us seriously or whatever it was. The Bhakta program, it's, it's artificial. You're forcing people to become devotees. Um, not, it's not always true, but that was a little bit, a little bit true. So we, we were trying to refine things and in trying to refine a lot of things just fell apart. And so what I saw, they fall apart, but they decreased. And so what I saw was a lot of these programs started again being reestablished on the level that they were or close to the level that they were when Prabhupada was here and things started going up. So book distribution, I don't know at what point it started going up, maybe 10 years ago, 15, there was a shift, 20, I'm not sure, but there was a there was a shift like late 90s, early 2000s. There was a shift to, like back to basics. Not that we can't innovate and not that we don't have to adapt. We do. We also have to do that. But the innovations and adaptations were always based on the basic principles of kirtan, prasadam, and class. And speaking Krishna consciousness, of course not watering it down, but speaking it in a way people can understand. And so I just noticed that the more those old tried and true programs came back, maybe came back in it with a new twist on them, but came back, the movement started getting stronger again, and things were expanding and temples were growing and becoming more stable and so on. So what happened? Prabhupada disappeared a little bit, and then he came back. When leaders you know, went off, went away, it's like Prabhupada wasn't being followed by the leader. That means, at least for the leader and maybe for the community, Prabhupada was distant now. And then as leaders became stronger, better, Prabhupada comes back. And then when Prabhupada's in the center, everything Everything happens, everything becomes successful. So I'll take your questions in a little bit. And um, I want to um, speak about the disappearance of the spiritual master. Now, it's very difficult, one of the most difficult things 
I've ever experienced was uh, disappearance of Srila Prabhupada. It was, um, we all felt like orphans that Prabhupada had left and here we were, you know, just uh, feeling spiritually just bereft that we're not ready to exist without our spiritual master. And, and, and one of the reasons is we become very dependent on our spiritual master because we know whenever we have a problem, we can just go to him and he'll solve it. And uh, it's gone. It was, it was like that for many devotees on a personal level. Of course, not everyone could do that with Prabhupada, but it was like that on a, on a movement level. Uh, if there were a problem, it never infested ISKCON because Prabhupada would solve it. And we saw that time and time again, Prabhupada solving problems that we couldn't solve ourselves. We, we would disagree. We, we didn't know the solution. Or, we, or one side knew the solution, but the other side didn't agree. So you go to Prabhupada and he would solve it. And so no controversies festered very long. They only festered as long as, they only existed as long as it took to get Prabhupada's response which was maximum maybe three weeks and sometimes three days or sometime five minutes. And so we had grown dependent on that, obviously, and accustomed to that. And so when Prabhupada left, wow, that was the, that was the biggest change. And so <clears throat> one of the things we realized when Prabhupada left was that because we were so dependent on him, we actually didn't understand Krishna consciousness as deeply as we thought we did. And so without him there to clarify anything and everything, we had to go more deeply into his books. We had to more go, go more deeply into the philosophy to understand it, because we realized we didn't understand it as deeply as we thought. So in a sense, it was a blessing, yeah, a blessing in the sense of it forced us to grow, it forced us to understand the philosophy, because now there was no Prabhupada to go to to answer the controversy, or to, to help us understand the Siddhanta. We had to understand it amongst ourselves. And so we can say that coming to that stage was necessary. And it seems that Krishna thought that 1977 was the time that we needed to grow up because he took Prabhupada from us. I was 27. I had been a devotee almost two years at that point. Excuse me, almost eight years at that point. So not that long. And um, certainly didn't feel qualified to make major decisions but that's what we had to do. And so it was definitely Krishna's desire. And it, it doesn't seem like it was the right thing. We were too young and we, we ran into so many problems, but probably even if Prabhupada stayed 10 more years, we probably would have run into many, if not all of the same problems. Uh, Prabhupada says chaos comes when the guru leaves. So I don't know if there was ever a time that you're actually ready for your guru to leave. But what I can say is that while he's present, uh, if, if you make your best efforts to understand his instructions, make your best efforts to understand Prabhupada's instructions, you will be in a much better position when he leaves because you will feel that you're being embraced and guided by those instructions that you've imbibe those instructions. And so even though he leaves, he's left you with all those instructions. And if you're living those instructions in your life, you won't really feel that he's gone because that's the real thing and you've got the real thing. But if, you be, if you're weak and you can't make it without your guru, then you'll feel the separation. So I can't go on in Krishna consciousness without my spiritual master. Now that would be because we haven't really imbibed the instruction right? We're not really living it. And so now we're feeling this intense separation. Of course, if 
uh, there's infighting amongst disciples or in the movement and things go down, then naturally we will feel the separation because in his absence, things got worse. But if we're able to follow his instructions and things go on or even improve in his absence, you won't really feel the absence. You will feel the presence because the instructions work and you'll see them working and they're, they're in your heart, they're in your life, you're surrounded by them. So that's, that's something to think about. The, the spiritual master is trying to help you become um, intelligent enough to understand Krishna consciousness in, in a way that you can practically apply it in your life. Of course, as young devotees, it takes time. But still, at least, at least we, under, we should understand that uh, the spiritual master is training the disciples to become in, as Prabhupada said, independently intelligent, to be able to use their intelligence to understand how to practice and how to spread Krishna consciousness, how to understand the philosophy, and get a, gra a deep grasp on what Prabhupada is teaching, what the, the acharyas or past acharyas are teaching, what Mahaprabhu is teaching. Uh, that's what he's come to give. And if a disciple has that, then as it said, the spiritual master and disciple, they live forever. They're never separated. How, how could they be separated? The disciple is living the instruction of the guru. He's helping spread the mission of the guru. How would there be any separation? They would always be together. So still, we have to, we have to prepare our consciousness in some way for the disappearance of our spiritual master, because it will happen at some point. And the more we are prepared, what we will find is the deeper we will go into Krishna consciousness after he leaves, the more we will step up to follow in his footsteps, because when he leaves, he leaves a vacuum, and in the vacuum has to be filled. Maybe we can never fill it perfectly, certainly in the case of Prabhupada, but we have to try to fill that vacuum as much as possible. And as it said, and as we've discussed before, the, the greatest admonition, the greatest honor you can give your spiritual master is to embody his teachings in your life and in the cultures you create. So when we create a culture based on Prabhupada's teachings, when we create communities based on Prabhupada's teachings, that's the greatest honor, greatest glorification, and I think the greatest service we can give to Prabhupada. Because then the whole world can see, can understand Prabhupada. So that is our seva to Prabhupada. That is our seva to our spiritual master. And um, I was noticing, I was working with disciples of Bhakti Tirtha Swami. They're doing lots of work around the world. They have many courses online now, trainings and counseling, because that was uh, Bhakti Chaitanya Maharaj's mood. And I was impressed how they're carrying on that work, because they realized how important the work of Bhakti Chaitanya Maharaj is, and so they've 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 carried on the culture. They've carried on the mood. And I can see they, they all feel really, really close to Bhakti Tirtha Swami by doing that. So that's how they honor him, by sharing his teachings, living his teachings, being an example. He, he wanted to create communities, healthy communities. He wanted devotees to have healthy and loving relationships. So by doing that, they, they feel close to him. And by teaching others that they feel close to him. So if you if you ever dread the thought of separation from your spiritual master, then now you know how not to be separated. He disappears physically, but then when he disappears physically, does he end up in your heart or does he end up far away from you? That well, that will that will depend on you. But you know, you say, well, he disappeared. No, he didn't. He disappeared from the eyes, but he entered my heart so I can see him. 
So he disappeared into my heart. That's, that's how we want to make the disappearance of the spiritual master. But um, it, it, the more we can bring him into our heart now and his instructions, then when he leaves, we will not feel that he's left. We will feel, no. He's always with me. Like um, Krishna had a friend called Madhu Mangal. Madhu Mangal is very funny. It's always joking. He said, and he said to Krishna, you know, you may think you're strong, but actually I'm stronger than you because I have you locked in my heart and you can't get out. You're not strong enough to get out. So if we can lock Srila Prabhupada and lock our spiritual master in our heart, then nothing can pull him out. Physical disappearance, not going to pull him out. Right? And the more we read Prabhupada's books, the more we appreciate Prabhupada. And the more we read them, the closer we feel to him. And the closer we feel to him, the less we feel the so-called separation. We don't feel it because why would we feel it if we're serving him and we're, we're living his instructions? How could we possibly feel separation? Of course, we're always going to feel this, this duality of I don't feel separation, but feeling the missing the sweetness of having him present because it creates a special atmosphere that that's difficult to in many ways it's difficult to duplicate without his presence that that's for sure and that we have to admit and that is just a reality i was last night we had the um rt for Prabhupada at the time he disappeared and they asked me to lead and um I was remembering um, 1972 when I was in Los Angeles, Prabhupada was there for three months. And so every day we'd get to see him for three months. Every day he would give class. And so you can imagine what the temple's like when Prabhupada's there. It's, it's on fire. It's, it's, like, it's like the spiritual world completely and everyone is blissful. And I was, I was remembering how that was so sweet. So sweet. So yes, you know, the times we spend with our spiritual master, that they're special, they're sweet. We want to relish them and cherish them. There's no question. And maybe there will be sweetness. It's so much kind of, so much sweetness in your life, but maybe never that, never that specific sweet. You know, like you like a lot of sweets. That one sweet, that's a unique sweet, that's for sure. So we we don't want to undermine the physical presence, the sweetness of it, the inspiration we get. But still, the real tangible presence is in his words. And of course, if we remember those words from the times we met him, then uh, those words will be the most important thing in our life. I was thinking we could do an exercise and say, you know, write down the 10 most important instructions for you that you got from your spiritual master. What, what are the 10 or five or 10 instructions that really you found essential for your spiritual life? And then uh, remember those instructions. And those instructions are non different than your spiritual master. And if your life has changed, it's because of your spiritual master. And, and, and it's always because of Srila Prabhupada, because your spiritual master couldn't do anything if it wasn't for Srila Prabhupada. So there's never any kind of disconnection. And of course, um, Prabhupada's instructions are vast. And you're all getting his instructions. So you're, as Prabhupada said, you're doubly blessed. If you read Bhagavatam, fourth canto, Prabhupada said, when the spiritual master leaves, the disciples should cry. So it is painful. There's no question.
So the pain will be there, but that pain in spiritual life will be will be the cause of your the pain will be the cause of your further advancement in Christian consciousness if you utilize the pain properly. Yeah, if you know what I mean. Utilize the pain properly as an impetus. You know, okay, my spiritual master has given me so much. Now he's not here. So I'm not missing anything. He's left me a treasure. He's left me so many jewels. Now let me examine all those jewels more, more closely. Sometimes we don't examine them more closely because we know, well, tomorrow's class will get more. So we kind of just put the jewels from yesterday's class in the cabinet. You know, and then we get some new jewels and we look at them and they go in the cabinet. But when he goes, you have to go in your cabinet and dust off those jewels and look at it. Oh, I've got all these jewels here. So don't, don't think you don't have them. Right? So um, I will stop. That's all I wanted to say. And uh, I'm not planning to die anytime soon. Sounds like this was a speech, like uh, I'm planning to like go back to Godhead or some fast to death or something. No, I'm not planning. I'm just saying in general, for um, both for your spiritual master and for Srila Prabhupada, it's disappearance is very subjective. Okay, so let's go. We were having problems with the sound because I didn't have my mic plugged in. Just a minor detail. The lesson for today is if you want to get sound out of your microphone, plug it in. It works better that way. So P has a question. How do we make sure that parts of the message doesn't change when we write explanations of Prabhupada's preaching? I'm sure, of course, that you all do your best that you're doing it in a beautiful and knowledgeable way. But is there no risk for misinterpretation? I'm so sorry, this is strange. Yeah, there are risks. The risks, um, there are, are risks, so why would it happen? Um, it can happen because you have a preconceived idea and you wanna have Prabhupada support that idea, even though he doesn't support it, but you can adjust things in a way to make it look like he supports it. Or perhaps he said one thing to support you and a hundred things that didn't support what you want to say. And the first thing he said was in 1967, and that's what you're quoting. And then after 1967, he said a hundred things to the contrary. And you want to use that one quote from 1967 to say that this is what Prabhupada wants. So that's that's an example that you might have a motive in 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 that, right? Whatever your motive may be. You you your motive may be thinking that this is what would be the best for Krishna consciousness, but it's not objectively what Prabhupada said. So uh, sometimes we just misunderstand something we don't have enough knowledge. We may, we may lack understanding at a certain point of immaturity in our Christian consciousness. And therefore, we, we may explain something that's a little fuzzy, you could say, not, not really clear thinking. It could be a logical way of thinking, not clearly understanding what Prabhupada meant. These things are there. So if you personally, are not sure, then you can ask somebody, senior, and say, this is, it appears Prabhupada's saying this, do I understand this correctly? That's always good. And you will hear many classes, and probably in some of those classes, it's going to clarify things that you misunderstood. So uh, that's the benefit of hearing from senior devotees or talking to them, they can help you. So misunderstanding is, is in one sense inevitable, but we have to do our best to objectively understand Prabhupada without 
any kind of motive to make any point. Sometimes Prabhupada makes points that uh, like we wish he didn't make, isn't it? You ever read something and say, I wish he didn't say that. That's like, that's so hard to accept. Or what to speak of, difficult to explain to other people. I don't want to tell other people that. They won't understand it. Okay, that may be true. Why did he say it? What's the point? Can't say he didn't say it. We can't rationalize it away, but we can explain it. Let's explain why he said that. What's the context? You know, what's the Vedic context? And what is the current context? And how is it being applied? What did he mean? Our duty is to try to understand Prabhupada as clearly as possible and share that with others. And so we can't make Prabhupada say something he didn't say. And we can't make Prabhupada not say something he did say. That's where you run into trouble. Now, whether you want to explain everything Prabhupada said to everyone, that's that's a different question. You may not want to because people may not understand or be ready to understand. That's a different point. Right? But he did say it. I'm just, you know. Prabhupada said Mahatma Gandhi was a saint amongst politicians and a politician amongst saints. Or someone said that and Prabhupada quoted that. But if you go to India, in front of an audience and say that, it's not going to be good. So Prabhupada never said it publicly. So there, you know, there are certain views Prabhupada held which were not meant for the public. They were meant for our understanding. But uh, with the sentiment from Mahatma Gandhi in India as the father of the nation, if you said that, it could create a riot. People could get violent. You know, uh, every person in India could boycott ISKCON. So sometimes things are not meant to be shared publicly, but they're private information just to clarify tattva or the truth of a situation. Uh, hmm. Yeah. So we do our best to explain what Prabhupada explained. And the more you read Prabhupada's books, the more you understand what he's saying, and the easier it is to explain it. Right? Sometimes I hear a young devotee explain something, but I can see that um, he hasn't read or he hasn't read enough, so the, the pieces are missing. And so when you add the pieces, you get a slightly different picture. So it's just the liability of learning. I mean, we're all here. Well, I made it through the days when the oldest devotee in ISKCON was four years. I'm still here. Yeah. So we get the basic idea right. There may be a few details that we didn't get right, but no disasters because of it. Well, there was one potential disaster, but they got something really wrong. It's, it's, it's more like we get some, something slightly wrong Mostly right, slightly wrong. But if you get it mostly wrong, then it's a problem. And that rarely doesn't, that rarely happens. So Krishna Karshani says, from what you're saying, it seems that not every devotee is ready to have personal association with Guru. You said many that many of the disciples of Prabhupada who were close to him left or deviated. And many didn't, who did not have much of his personal association are very successful creatures. I think what I mean, that's true, what you say, but having uh, the other thing is, is, is just a simple point that having personal association doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do more service or be more advanced. You might be because of it. And it could that personal association could be invaluable for you, but it's not a guarantee that is going to be invaluable for you. Not a guarantee that will help you. Generally, it will help you. Generally, it is special. But there are some devotees who, 
I didn't seem to know how to take advantage of Prabhupada's association. And uh, they had it and they gave it up. Could you imagine that? Yeah. You were thinking, oh, if I could just see Prabhupada. And he had personal servants that gave up Krishna consciousness, left him and gave up Krishna consciousness. Does that make sense to you? From your vantage point, it doesn't, right? How could they do that? Why would they do that? It happens. So sometimes, sometimes the Shastra says that it's better to be distant from the Guru. Because if you're too close, you can take the spiritual master for granted. Uh, you could make offenses. So he's just like an ordinary person, just a little more advanced. And, you know, we, we, we don't want to be critical, offensive. That's not going to help us. And so there's always that tendency to be critical of someone that you spend a lot of time with. So it is, it's a delicate, it's a delicate thing. I'm not saying every devotee would have this problem, but some, some do. Something to consider. You know, when Prabhupada's servants came into his room, Prabhupada wanted them to pay obeisances and chant his full pranam mantras. And a lot of times they would, you know, they'd be bringing in a plate, they'd put it down, then they'd bow down. But they'd bow down, just touch their head down and wouldn't say anything or say Jai Prabhupada or something like that. And Prabhupada was a little, little concerned about that. So he said, he said, what is this? And it was like, what? Prabhupada said, hatchet. What is this hatchet? So he said, what do you mean, Prabhupada? This paying obeisances, jumping up, paying obeisances, jumping up like a hatchet. You should pay obeisances properly. Namahum Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prashtaya Bhuta, like that. So Prabhupada was always, you know, cautious that disciples may be minimizing his position as guru. And he just wanted to make sure that didn't happen. So you have to be a little careful. It's not that the guru wants to be maximized, so to speak. It's not that he wants it. But because Krishna has appointed him to take that position, then he has to take the service of his disciples. So if he sees the disciple minimizing some of the formalities, he might become concerned, not because he needs it, but just because that's part of the protocol. It's just, you know, what it means. Now, for us in the West, we might think, hmm, I don't know, it's a little artificial or, you know, I, I, you know, I don't like all the protocol. But for people in India, that protocol is just normal. That's just normally how you deal with a teacher. And in other, some other parts of the world, like China also, a very, very high respect is given to teachers. Not so much in America. Maybe in the past, now, not so much. It's hard to be a teacher, high school, junior high school teacher. There's often little or no respect. Maybe you get tomatoes in your face even. Or they'll talk back to the teacher, or, you know, whatever. So, you know, that's, that's traditional culture that you have respect for the teacher like that. But... Uh, obviously, the closer the association, the more chance for advancement and the more chance for messing up, <laughs> for making mistakes, right? Kind of, uh, you know, scary to cook for your spiritual master. What if he doesn't like it? It's like, who made this? Who? How did you learn how to cook? from the dog on the street, what's wrong with you? So, you know, then you get chastised. It's like, ah. So, if you're gonna cook for your guru, make sure you know what he likes and you know how to cook. 
Of course, Marsh gurus, uh, they're merciful, not gonna, you know, say anything sometimes like that, but still. I have another question. Hmm. This is from Christa. When people leave ISKCON, is it because their relationship with Prabhupada was poor? And if so, what could we do to awaken that relationship in their hearts so they want to come back? I mean, it depends what you mean by relationship is poor. They may have full trust in Prabhupada. They just may not be following his advice. So in that sense, they have a good relationship and a bad relationship at the same time. Consciously, they have a good relationship because they have faith in Prabhupada. But through practice, they have a bad relationship because they're not practicing what Prabhupada asked them to do. So we all know that Maya is strong and we all know that Prabhupada has given us a program to counteract Maya. So if we don't follow that program, then for most devotees, they won't be able to maintain a very strong level of Krishna consciousness. And if you if you don't have a strong level of Krishna consciousness, then you're not experiencing a transcendental bliss. And if you're not experiencing transcendental bliss, you're going to look for your bliss somewhere else. And it's not going to be in the spiritual world. That's the problem. You will look for bliss somewhere, that's for sure. Don't doubt that. And if you don't get it from Krishna, you'll look for it somewhere else. I don't, I don't know if you all realize how important it is to be happy and satisfied in Krishna consciousness. Because if you're not, you're going to look for it somewhere else. I mean, I know you've heard this. You've probably said it to so many people. But it's, it's worth reminding ourselves that that's an essential element. So, you know, I could be happy materially, that's possible with, you know, just a little drop of Krishna consciousness here or there. I have no guilt, no anxiety. I don't have to chant my rounds, follow principles, just, you know, be a free spirit and uh, have a free conscience and, you know, be a nice person. I feel happy. That's okay. But it's not going to get you back to Godhead. I don't know if you want to be happy in Maya. It's not the best place to be happy. It's better to be happy in Krishna than happy in Maya. Right? You know, some people are really happy. And they say, I'm really happy. I go, I'm really sorry to hear that. Because why would I say, of course, I wouldn't tell them that. But, but why would I be sorry to hear it? Because if I'm really happy in Maya, where's the impetus to get out of it and go to Krishna? Why do I need Krishna? I'm happy without him. But the same, at the same token, why do I need Maya? I'm happy with Krishna. I'm happy without Maya. Why do I need Maya? I'm happy without Maya. I'm happy with Krishna. So it's very important to find that place in spiritual life where you're happy, whatever that is. We've talked about this a lot. You know, what is it that inspires you? Do that. You feel whole. You feel satisfied. You feel blissful. You know, if you chant your rounds well, you'll feel that. If you get to read Prabhupada's books regularly, you'll feel that. If you get good association, you'll feel it. Good prasadam, nice festivals you can attend. You'll feel blissful. And if you feel blissful, then you're good in Krishna consciousness. If you don't, then naturally you're going to look for your bliss somewhere, right? If you go grocery shopping and that store doesn't have what you want, you'll go to another store until you find what you want, right? So in the store of ISKCON, if you don't find what you want, you're going to go in the store of Maya. You'll go some store because you're hungry, right? You just can't avoid it. We, we're all hungry for happiness. Well, Krista, as far as why people leave ISKCON, there, there could be many, many reasons. So. And what you suggest could be one. But you could say it's a foundational reason. But... Um, 
I love Prabhupada, but I may not follow his instruction. So the love's not perfect. And so because it's not perfect, it's going to create problems in your spiritual life. Saradiya Rasa says, is it possible that some of Srila Prabhupada's statements were his personal opinion informed by his social context and not absolute truth? Well, um, you would know that if he said this is my opinion, then, then yes, the answer would be yes. Um, the, the question would be, yes, that could be personal opinion, like when he's talking about politics, I think there'll be this war, or you know, if this politician leaves, then this will happen. That that we can understand. As a Prabhupada pontificating on, you know, things with with this world. Uh, but this question presents a problem. Where where's the demarcation line between what would be his opinion and what wouldn't be if he didn't say this is my opinion? I would make that demarcation line general. I, I don't know if every situation we could agree on where the demarcation is. Uh, Prabhupada said he's not omniscient. Some devotees believe he is. So that becomes a problem. Doesn't he see past, present, and future? Therefore, wouldn't everything, isn't Krishna dictating to him? Therefore, wouldn't everything he say be true? You would think that, but he said himself, I'm not omniscient. That's the spiritual master is not omniscient. So most of those opinionated statements you will find in room conversations or morning walks, private, private discussions where they're just discussing something that's going on in this world. And, you know, sometimes Prabhupada gives his opinion. How do we know it's opinion? Well, it's, there's no, it's not discussed in Shastra. It's a contemporary event. This is why these people did this. They wanted the money or they wanted the position. So they made up this statement. Okay, that's Prabhupada's, that's his observation. You could say that's his opinion. And usually with many of those opinions, they're, they're not always, or most of the time, not really relevant to your spiritual life. Anyway, you know, well, Prabhupada said this politically, but I think politically it's going to be different. It doesn't really matter anyway for your Krishna consciousness because it's just about some relative event in this world. You know, one time Prabhupada said there would be a war, 1975. He said there'd be World War III. So it's a long time from 1975 and it hasn't happened. So Prabhupada was just looking at the political situation of the world and saying, if it continues the way it's going, they're going to have to use their proliferating weapons, they're going to have to use them. And the way the political situation of the world was, he was lining up countries, who will fight with who, who will oppose, who will, who will form alliances, who will oppose who. You know, right? But then the situation changed, changes. But when they asked Prabhupada, why didn't later they asked him a couple of years later why didn't ha it happen he said our sankirtan movement prevented it so you know so these are uh, uh, things Prabhupada said that or de maybe dependent on things going a certain way yeah so that's not he didn't say if things continue this way it will happen like this he just said it will happen but uh, Prabhupada said, by the year 2000, you could do a database search and say, by the year 2000, by the year 2001, by the year 19, you could look for predictions. By the year blank, you can look for the prediction. By the year 2000, Prabhupada said the Christian religion would be finished. 2000 is come and gone, long gone. The Christian religion seems to be going strong. But Prabhupada in that letter gave an if. He said, if we continue preaching as vigorously as we're doing now, they would be exposed. Nobody would accept them. And uh, they wouldn't be taken seriously. I, I still have the hardest time 
understanding how people can take them seriously, especially the ones who tell you you're going to go to hell forever for joining the wrong church. I, I just, I don't have a place in my brain to understand how anyone could believe that. It, but I understand indoctrination, and so th therefore I can understand if you've been indoctrinated into it, you, it's just normal to think that way. But for a rational person to think that God's going to send someone to hell forever for joining the wrong church, that's like, I don't know. That doesn't make sense to me. So Prabhupada was looking at that, you know, saying, what power do they have? They're killing cows. They have a philosophy full of contradiction. If we preach, people will see this is actually much better. And Christianity, will people will lose interest. But I guess we haven't preached as strongly as we were doing in 19, when he wrote that letter, which was maybe set 1973. So that was a prediction, it didn't happen, but it was a condition. We didn't meet the condition. So that's also there. Did you know that prediction? Any of you? Did you hear? Have you heard that prediction? There's a letter Prophet wrote to the temple president of San Diego when I was there. So we're looking at 72 or 73, that all these nonsense religions will be finished. Prabhupada, um, you know, he made lots of predictions about how Christian consciousness would spread. And when you hear these predictions, it, they're actually all unbelievable. The way the world is and the way that our movement is doesn't seem like any of these predictions would come to pass. And Prabhupada said, if everyone chants Hare Krishna and takes prasadam, they can all, we can send them all back to Godhead. Things like that, you know. You know people who've taken prasadam and chanted and they don't look like they're going back to Godhead. So, you know, the conclusion is that some things we just have to accept at face value that this is. Prabhupada's prediction, it's spiritual. And the material predictions, and you can take them as you like. I wouldn't, you know, reject them per se. And then, of course, we have the women 64 ounce brain, so um, informed by his social cultural context. It was informed by Scottish Church's college professor. What was his name? I forgot his name. Professor who Prabhupada mentions his professor that he learned he learned this from. You know, maybe we as his disciples should have said, well, that's what they taught then, they don't teach it now. But anyway, Prabhupada said it. It's not in his books. But that makes two assumptions that the size of the brain is equivalent to the level of intelligence. And the other assumption is that bigger women still have smaller brains than small men, which weight-wise has not been proven to be true. So, yeah. So we just say, oh, well, that's what he learned. So he was repeating that. It seemed to be useful in his preaching. So he repeated it. Why did he repeat it? Because it seemed to be an accepted scientific fact. And if people were to accept it, he thought, okay, then I can make a point using it. But turns out it's not an accepted scientific fact, so it didn't really help the argument. But if something isn't a scientific accepted fact, and it makes a point, then Prabhupada would use it, because he assumed that they accept the point. So then he could say, this is scientific right here. He didn't care if it was valid science or not. He just wanted, if he wanted to make a point, using their science, if they accepted it, he would use it. Because it's, if somebody accepts something already, it's easier to convince them, right? And then Prabhupada joked, he said, oh, yeah, well, well, when the women become devotees, then their brain grow, grows to 64 ounces. So, you know, now, now where do you go with that argument? Did you know, ladies, your brain has grown bigger since joining ISKCON? I'm not sure it was the second day or the third day after joining. Maybe it was a week or 10 days. I don't have the exact thing, but it did grow bigger. Um, I would say to join ISKCON, you must have already had a bigger brain because Krishna says less intelligent people don't surrender to him. So I would say your brain already grew. So that was Prabhupada's joke. 
But once I said, okay, I, I have to resolve this issue once and for all. So I went through Prabhupada's books and I searched less intelligent. And I would say 98% of the time it came up that people who don't surrender to Krishna are less intelligent. There was very little about women in there. It's mostly about people who don't surrender. They're less intelligent. So ladies, if you ever lose your self-esteem, just remember, there are many foolish men out there who have not surrendered to Krishna, which makes you more intelligent than all of those guys. So you can now get your self-esteem back. Hey, I'm smarter than all you guys, because I'm a devotee. You can't tell me. You can't tell me I'm less intelligent. So Stephanie is asking. If I want to tell an inquiring person some Krishna Leela, like lifting a Govardhan, is it better just to read the Krishna book, or can I just tell the story, especially if it would be awkward to read it at that moment? As long as you tell it correctly, yeah, no problem. Maybe you can tell it better. Maybe you're a good storyteller. Maybe you could tell it in a video. That would be better. <laughs> She does animation, so you could do animation. Well, I'm glad you brought this question up because communication is all about taking what you're learning and putting it into the language that and, and the means that is most easily acceptable, understandable, and resonates with people. So the answer to your question is definitely yes. That's that's the whole way that the, the, the disciplic succession has come down. It's just through explanation so that common people can understand something that was was maybe common knowledge at, at another time in history, but not common now. And so put, um, you know, like that book, The Power of Now, that, bo that book put Eckhart Tolle on the charts, right, in the public eye. That book was just a modern adaptation of the principle of mindfulness, which is a basic premise of Buddhism, which is meaning to be in the present moment, which is what you require for meditation, and how by being in the present moment, you come, it's basically you come to more of a sattvic position, because Thomas Tambaguna is the past, Rajaguna is in the future, I'll get this. Tambaguna is, ah, oh, the past, it was all horrible, I feel bad. Or the past, it was good, it's not good now, I'm lamenting, so you're living in the past. And sattva is the state of existence where you experience happiness, you live in the present. So there's some, there's some kind of material happiness from being mindful. So, you know, he became famous teaching mindfulness in a way that was relatable to people and teaching in a way that was practical, practical for the average person who's not a practicing Buddhist. And he became, you know, extremely successful by doing that. So that's a, that's a good example. Um, I'm sure you've all seen videos here or there of somebody, not someone part of our movement or any, even a Gaudiya Vaishnava necessarily, taking some principle from the Gita or Bhagavatam or something and then applying it in a practical context and getting a lot of, um, buy-in from people. And then we're thinking, wait a minute, how come we're not doing that? Well, that's what we should be doing. I mean, maybe what he, way he's, sometimes the way they teach it, it's all just for material benefits. So that's why we're not doing it. Become determined like Arjuna, and next year you'll be a millionaire. Well, we're not gonna necessarily teach that. We'll say, be determined like Arjuna, but the question is, what are you gonna be determined about or for? Because if I just teach you how to be determined, you may be determined to destroy the world. And that's my, then I will be liable for destroying the world. So determination in and of itself is not a great quality. It depends what you're determined to do. So that's the problem why we can't teach everything like they teach it, because they'll just to teach determination by itself and let you go out and do what you feel you should do. But still, it is our job to take these principles and apply them in a way that people can digest them, 
understand, resonate with, apply, and, and get closer to Krishna consciousness. So that's the art of communication. And all I can say is go for it. Let us know when we cook for you. Oh yeah, just um, in Cape Town again, yeah. Well, if you have Rath Yatra next year, maybe. Just don't make it on the 23rd of April. Tell Sarub Dhamma. Not It's got to be after the 23rd of April, if you want me to come. I'm just waiting to go back to South Africa for Rath Yatra. They have one of the nicest Rath Yatras in the world there. The last time I was there, I don't know when it was, four years ago or something. They, they have um, like tents and the tents, the different speakers speak in the tents all throughout the day. And they, they get up to 100, 150 people in these tents. Uh, first Rathayatra I went to there, we, we had a tent. It was quite a big tent. And we were teaching people to chant Japa, maybe like 150 people each session. And then we, everyone had beads. And most of the people took the beads home. They wanted to chant. So it's really special. Paramanda has a question. Seems that now we have a war in the name of improving health. Many people are dying because of the so-called elixir from the jab. It looks like it's a white glove war. For production of these elixirs, parts of the fetuses of aborted children are added in many points such as graphene, aluminum, etc. What to do? Well, come to America and get our vaccinations because they don't have any of that. <laughs> We're getting the wrong vaccinations in Poland because our vaccinations don't have that stuff. They may have other bad stuff, but they may have other stuff that's not healthy. I don't know. We'll find out if everyone who took the jab is like, is going to enter the mental hospital in three years. That's the prediction. It's going to take three years. Um, but um, you're getting that, the va yeah, vaccines generally have a lot of that stuff, but the vaccines, they're not really vaccines, they're something else. Some of them are old time vaccines, but some of them use a different technology, so they don't have all that stuff. You forgot to add mercury to it. Mercury is like really bad, and our teeth are, if you're my generation, our teeth are full of mercury which is not good. Um, anyway, there's always going to be, you know, if it's not vaccination problem, you know, Kali will put in another problem. You know, it's the way it works. So, you know, all will not be solved if the world, as some want the whole world to get vaxxed and some want no one to get vaxxed. There'll still be other problems. Current research in neuroscience proves that there is no significant difference in the size of men and women's brains when taking body weight into consideration. And did they also prove there's no significant difference? They say the number of creases in the brain determines your intelligence. Yeah, I mean, okay, ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you what I learned from my physics teacher at one of the best schools in America, UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles. He said, physics or chemistry? I think it's physics. Had to take a physics class. He said, this is the theory we believe today. This is the theory they believed 50 years ago. This is the theory they believed 100 years ago. This is the theory they believed 200 years ago. And what theory we will believe in the future, I am not sure. I'm sitting there going, and my father's spending all this money for me to go to this school and learn a theory that's going to become obsolete when the next new theory comes. You know, these were these were part of the events that helped me become a devotee because I was, I was, um, my nature was I always wanted to understand like what is truth. And then you get these professors. I told the story many times. I had a philosophy professor. He said, "I have no idea what the truth is." So you're wasting your time if you come to my class. It's like okay, you know. Three strikes and you're out. I was two teachers, you know, in the first year and a half at university telling me I don't know a damn thing. Or none of the scientists know a damn thing. So uh, what am I doing here? 
you know, spending, you know, so many hours a day. How can one maintain good Krishna consciousness if there is a situation around the health and life of even a devotee? Um, depends what you focus on, you know. The interesting thing about this vaccination is some people swear to the Supreme Personality of Godhead that you gotta get it and that's the only way to get rid of the virus. And some people swear to the Supreme Personality of Godhead that is the worst thing that ever has hit human society. So, sounds like a word to me. And the, the people that on, uh, the people who are on either side are not all non-devotees and on one side all devotees. Devotees are on both sides, so. I don't know. I think there's better things to think about, don't you, Paramananda? Like Mother Yasoda tying up Krishna or something like that. <laughs> what did Mother Yasoda vaccinate Krishna or not? At least you could think about that. That way you'll be thinking about Krishna. Did, if Krishna were here, would he advise us to take the vaccine? At least you're thinking of Krishna. Okay, so we're going to end class here. Thank you all for coming. I hope this was helpful. Yeah. If we only use 10% of our brains, well, yeah. <laughs>